Welcome everyone to an evening with Roxane Gay in conversation with Isaac Fitzgerald. I'm Chip Rawley, director of PEN America's World Voices Festival. As most of you here tonight would know, we had to reschedule this event. It was originally supposed to be in festival week back in April, that's seven weeks ago now. It's a testament to the love and passion you have for this author tonight that you came here not once, but twice to see her. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you tonight you will not be disappointed. Now it's also, I want to say, and it's very important to say, it's a testament to Roxanne and Isaac's devotion and commitment to what PEN America is and what PEN America does, that they are with us tonight. We at PEN America are deeply honored by their presence. Their being here tonight will help us, and your all being here tonight will help us do the important work that is the mission of PEN, which is to celebrate and promote literature in events like this, in literary awards, in programming throughout the year, as well as the World Voices Festival every spring, and in our advocacy for freedom of expression both here and abroad. <laughs> Near the end of the conversation, we're gonna open up to audience questions. You know the drill, keep it short, keep it sweet. This is not a time for your dissertation. It's a time, your, your audience, fellow audience members will thank you to keep it short and sweet and to the point and in the form of a question. So we'll answer as many questions as we can. Now after that, Roxanne Gay has agreed to do a book signing. So for those of you who haven't yet bought your books, at the end of this event, when we conclude, there will be book sales at the back of this auditorium over in that direction. And then we'll ask everyone who wants a book signed to line up along this side wall and back wall, beginning over here, stage left. And we'll try to get through that as quickly and efficiently as possible. But we're really excited about that. Now, tonight's guests, Isaac Fitzgerald is co-author of Pen and Ink, Tattoos and the Stories Behind Them, and Knives and Ink, Chefs and the Stories Behind Their Tattoos. But of course, most of you here will know him from him sneaking into your timeline every morning with the BuzzFeed Twitter morning show, AM to DM. Roxane Gay is the best-selling author of fiction and nonfiction whose books include Bad Feminist, Difficult Women, an Untamed State, Hunger, World of Wakanda, and the recently released collection, Aiti. She's also the editor of the recently published, Not That Bad, Dispatches from Rape Culture. But you are here tonight because you know all of this. And you know she also happens to be one of the most authentic and intellectually courageous writers publishing today. Please join me giving a New York welcome to Ro Isaac Fitzgerald and Dr. Roxane Gay. Sorry, I just had to do that, you know? I don't get to do that very often. Thank you very much, Isaac. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for coming out. Uh, I want to get right into it. Let's just get right into it. Let's get dirty. Woo, let's get dirty. Uh, listen, this was a tough week. <sighs> yeah, that, that yeah, feeling. I mean, it was, what the fuck? What the fuck, indeed. Um, being a person is hard. Uh, being a celebrity can be difficult, being famous can be difficult. Um, you published an essay recently, uh, What Fullness Is, and we're gonna get into that a bunch. But in that essay, you mentioned that you've gone back to therapy oh, yeah. for the first time, and you've been away for about 10 years. So I wanna start here, especially with the, the themes of, of mental health and the week that everybody's experienced. Um, how do you take care of yourself? I wish I knew. I'm not good at it yet, but I will be. Um, but I think, I watch a lot of Law and Order SVU, <laughs> and that soothes me. It's very relaxing. It's on pretty much every day. Um, and if that's not on criminal intent or the regular Law and Order is on, really any procedural other than NCIS will do. Uh, NCIS is fucking boring. It is, it is. And 
I just don't understand any of it. And the best character left. So Ziva, David. And so when she left, I was just like, no, this is done. Um, and, but you know, I'm trying now to learn how to take better care of myself because um, when you write and getting attention for it, it can be really overwhelming because everyone thinks they know you when they do not. And they want things from you and it's exhausting. And therapy is helping me to develop boundaries and to learn how to stand up for myself, which I'm really bad at in my personal life. So I'm just trying to figure it out. Just really trying to figure it out. Um, I wanted to draw attention, uh, Morgan Parker, who's an incredible poet, if you're not familiar with her work. Uh, on Twitter she said, uh, working through pain does not erase pain. And that was something you agreed with. Um, I was just wondering, how can we best be there for the people in our lives? Do you have anything you've done or said to other people that have helped or anything that other people have said and done for you that have helped uh, when it comes to support? You know, that's a good question and I don't know that there's a single right answer. But I think a lot of times people say, what can I do for you instead of just doing something? And I think it would be great sometimes if people just did things because I'm often so busy and so tired that I don't have time to also give you an itinerary of what you should do for me. <laughs> and I don't mean that in an arrogant way. I genuinely mean like, figure it out. It's not complicated. Um, I think if you see someone who is really overwhelmed, just sit with them talk with them, offer to take them out for a meal or to a movie. Um, if you know someone who actually needs to get help, help them do the work of getting there. Because when I'm really depressed, if you were to tell me, make an appointment with a doctor, like where on earth do you think I'm gonna find the energy to do that? Uh, so sometimes you have to help people to get the help that they need. And I also think we should all just make fewer assumptions about how people are doing I find that like sometimes on Twitter I just say I'm exhausted and people are like, but you should be grateful, you know, things are going so well for you. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you don't know me. And people oftentimes equate material success with emotional success and those two things are not synonymous. And so don't make assumptions about what people are doing despite what they may be projecting. I'm prolific, for example, because I self-medicate by writing. And it's not a, a great thing, it's just self-medication. It's, it's your way of working through it. You Absolutely. Also, you did tweet, my therapist is really, really good. Oh, he is, he's, a, he's an interesting guy. Uh, um, it took me a few weeks to sort of get on board with him because he's really frank and just a guy's guy, he's not, the kind of person I would naturally gravitate toward. But hey. Yeah, exactly. Now you are. <laughs> I'll gravitate toward you any day. <laughs> 715, just mark it, 715. My life has been made. Yeah, it's so hot up here. Um, but he really forces me to look at difficult things and that's important because I'm really good at avoiding difficult things and avoiding being honest with myself. And I'm just grateful because I've had very good therapists in the past and I've also had really bad ones. I have not been able to afford therapy until recently and so I'm just grateful that I can afford it now and that I'm in a place where I can take advantage of it. Do, any advice for somebody that maybe has a bad therapist? Like, how do you know when you have a bad therapist? I think you know you, when you have a bad therapist if you don't feel like anything is changing and you don't feel like you're being pushed or when you know that you're manipulating the therapist, which is one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I think a lot of times those of us who are difficult to therapy, um, think I'm smarter than this person. And yeah, that may be the case, but if you find yourself consistently thinking that and being proud, then you maybe have a bad therapist who hasn't called you out on that yet. 
Uh, so there are lots of signs, um, but really it's if you don't feel comfortable, if you don't feel like you're being your most honest self, if you don't feel like you're making any sort of progress toward whatever your goals are, uh, you might not be in the right therapy situation. Um, what, uh, on like a larger scale, what do you think needs to change um, in how we as a society deal with depression, deal with mental illness, uh, and I just, you know, let's say the word, deal with people that are going through suicidal thoughts, suicidal notions. I don't know that there are easy answers, but I do think that as a country, we need to start treating mental health in the same way that we treat physical health, and that we need to treat mental health care in the same way we treat physicals and vaccines and other routine forms of health care. It needs to be routine and it needs to be supported and affordable, and health insurance companies need to support it. So I think a lot of the changes need to happen actually legislatively and in terms of policy. But I also think we need to find ways to reduce the stigma around A, saying I'm depressed, and then B, not trying to immediately fix it, or say smile, or say cheer up as if it's merely temporary sadness and thinking some happy thoughts will just make everything better. That's not what depression is. And I also notice on days like today, I find the internet less than comforting on days after someone commits suicide that's famous. Because there's, it's well intended, but there's so many people that say, we love you and blah, blah, blah. and. I know you mean that, but to someone who's depressed, that doesn't mean anything. When you're depressed, you can't hear that, and it doesn't comfort you. In fact, it just makes me feel worse. Like, oh, you love me? I'm trash? Why are you wasting your time? Um, and all of the like sharing of the phone numbers, and again, this is well-intended good stuff, but I don't know that it actually helps anything, except for the people who are saying it. I think that's the form of comfort for themselves, but I don't know that it's a form of comfort for people who are truly hurting. And so I just think maybe we could find a less oppressive way of mourning publicly. A less oppressive way of mourning publicly. Uh, I think that I really, really agree. Also, I do want to say to the audience, if Roxanne says anything that you think is brilliant, feel free to tweet it. This is not a class. You can get your, <laughs> I got my phone out on stage. Feel free. Go nuts. This is not. You have your phone in your wallet. I got my phone. One. You I like a, that you clock that. You have a follet. You got to. <laughs> you hit me with follets. That was a nice. a follet. What did you think of that? Uh, I'm going to switch to the notebook now. Phone. Well, uh, I, 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 oh. <laughs> Let's talk about I'm that teacher. essay that I mentioned. Yes. Let's what go. fullness is, mm -hmm. which is part of a package of essays on body image that you edited for Medium, but this is an essay you wrote yourself. It was incredibly powerful, incredibly complex, so many issues. For those that aren't familiar, could you talk a little bit about it? And were you scared of the reaction that you were going to get? And what did you think of the reaction the piece actually did get? Yes. Um, so I edited this collection of essays for Medium called Unruly Bodies. And I asked 24 writers to answer, to respond to the prompt, what does it mean to live in an unruly body? And I was thrilled because every writer wrote something different and wrote something really interesting and complex. And I also had to write an essay. And uh, so I wrote an essay about getting weight loss surgery in January. And it was difficult to write the essay, even though I wrote it fairly quickly, because I was so stressed out about what the internet was going to say in response, especially after hunger. And I was worried about fat people feeling like I was letting them down in some way. So um, I agonized, not only about writing the essay, but of course the decision that prompted the essay. And so I was really worried that people were going to sort of burn me in effigy. I mean, on a small scale. I, I don't have delusions of grandeur. But <laughs> I was worried nonetheless. Uh, and I was really heartened. For the most part, the responses were very generous. And most people were just like, it's your life. 
do what you need to do, which is exactly what I did. And of course, there were people that did, did not agree. And <laughs> it's interesting. When you're fat, people tell you to lose weight. And when you finally do the thing that they want you to do to lose weight, they criticize the choice that you made. And so there were all sorts of online forums where, who were like, look at this disgusting fat person who took the easy way out, as if having yourself cut open and ch you know, changing your entire body for the rest of your life is easy. Um, so that was difficult, but I tried not to read that stuff. It's just Google Alerts sends you a lot of the stuff that resides on the crusty bottom of the internet. <laughs> and I click too much. Like, I should just, like, go away. But no, there I am, like, hmm, what is this saying about me? <laughs> Fucking ridiculous. Maybe Patriot 6969 actually has some good thoughts. I Let's know. see. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nope, they're terrible. Look, Shit. MAGA 213 has a lot to say. I must find out. That was actually a much better n username. Because I actually love Patriots. I'm yeah. a Patriot, and I love 69. So I mean, <laughs> what's not to love, Isaac? What's not to love? Basically just saying, it was my username, my secret oh, username. Oh, uh, that was you? Mm. You're a bad, bad boy. <laughs> <laughs> can keep this going. Uh, I, All night long. There's a moment. <laughs> There's a moment in the essay where you, you get recognized. Your nurse, you're coming out of the surgery, the nurse is looking over you and says, oh, I know who you are, I read your books. Me and my girlfriend love you. Yeah. And you yeah. say? I said, don't tell the internet I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> and she didn't, which I mean, because of HIPAA laws, but. <laughs> But also, I think, just because of kindness. But I was stunned because I'm just a writer. And so when the recovery room nurse recognizes you, you're like, what the fuck? And I, I was so high um, on whatever amazing drugs they gave me. Uh, and I, because I had told them, as I tell the anesthesiologist before every surgery, give me extra. I'm fat. Um, and so I want to make sure that you give me an appropriate dose. I don't want to wake up during the surgery, like in that movie, awake. Uh, and each time the anesthesiologist says, I hate that fucking movie. And I say, that's well and good, but make sure you give me extra. So I was like still floating and just like, what's up? It was funny. It was weird. It was surreal. It was like worlds colliding. And I, every time I would go to the pre-appointments, someone would recognize me and say, what are you doing here? Medicine? <laughs> I mean, is, and is, is it a concern as you walk through the world that people see you and will just start talking about you on the internet? It happens yeah. a lot. So, yeah. But it's not something that keeps me up at night at all. I don't even think about it unless I'm in a situation where I'm doing something I don't want to be caught doing. <laughs> Go on. Well, <laughs> on Thursdays. <laughs> so, no, I, yeah, it's just something that comes up sometimes. Because most writers, we get to be anonymous because nobody knows what writers look like. But I'm visible, I have tattoos, I'm 6'3", I'm fat, and so I stand out. And so I'm easily recognizable. And so I don't get the normal and glorious anonymity that you usually get as a writer, where people on Twitter might know who you are, but people in the grocery store are, are like, hey, Bob, what's up? So, yeah. You talked in the essay, though, too, about how sometimes your size can feel like power, how it's, there's something that you like about it as well. And I was wondering if you could just kind of talk a little bit on that. Well, I mean, especially as a woman, I think there is power in taking up space and power in having a physique that's intimidating to people. Go ahead, you can clap. It's great because when I was little, I was little and I always felt scared and inconsequential, but now I feel like I have gravity and uh, there's something very powerful and pleasant about that. 
and um, I would hate to lose that. I mean, and something you wrote about in Hunger quite a bit. Mm -hmm. what, how did it feel to put that in the world, to say that loudly? It felt good, and it also felt scary because you're not supposed to admit that you like taking up space. You're supposed to want to be smaller and smaller and smaller until you disappear. The entire diet industry is predicated on making women disappear. And so to work against that and say, I don't want to disappear, I want to take up as much space as possible, is kind of heretic in this society. And so I, it was my truth, um, but it was scary to admit that, to go against the grain in that way. The diet, can you say that what you said about the diet, in, the diet industry exists? I think it's predicated on making women disappear. And it's predicated on this idea that every woman needs to lose weight, which is really mind-blowing when you think about it. And what a lot of people don't realize is that a lot of the studies that various weight loss companies use to promote their products are commissioned by the weight loss companies and the makers of uh, weight loss drugs. And so uh, you have to question the messenger sometimes. Absolutely, 100%. Uh, another thing, and I'm going to read a quote here from your piece. Oh. Healthcare is as wantonly susceptible to the ills of capital capitalism as everything else. Um, can you talk about the nitty gritty, the financial side of uh, just getting this surgery and also the recovery from it? Yeah. Um, so health insurance companies are corrupt and evil, and <laughs> they are. Fuck big diet. And fuck healthcare. Yeah, they're horrible. And they tell you to lose weight, but then they don't want to pay for weight loss surgery. And most health insurance companies won't. My health insurance company actually does, but you have to do six months of supervised medical, medical weight loss. And that's actually fine in many ways, but I, given my travel schedule, didn't have six months to sit around in Indiana um, <laughs> with a doctor I didn't like losing weight, um, because if I could lose weight on my own, I would have already. <laughs> and so I decided to self-pay, and so it was $25,000 for the surgery. Yeah, it was, it hurt, it hurt to pay that bill. I was just like, motherfucker. <laughs> and about $5,000 for all of the testing and blood work and the vitamins and the protein shakes and that you drink for like two weeks and blah, blah, blah. It was expensive. Do you think, I mean, just talking about how we can change things in society about um, mental health, health um, and, and how we view depression, what can we do to try and change the healthcare system? <laughs> Blow it up. Uh, <laughs> no, really. I think that in many ways we need to start over and we need to start from a place of universal health care. Uh, and I think we need to stop treating bodies that stray from an arbitrary norm as problems that need to be solved. Um, and fat bodies are not problems. Uh, how you treat fat bodies are problems. And I would love for the healthcare industry to get on board with that because you can be fat and healthy. And people get really uncomfortable when you say that. And they say, but, there's always a but. Like, what about in 20 years? How about we worry about today? Um, there's, and it's easier and healthier to just stay consistent in size than it is to yo-yo diet, which so many of us do. And I, we just need to reorient our thinking around bodies, what healthy bodies look like, and how doctors treat fat bodies. Because in many ways, fat people are not getting health care at all in this country. We are just told, lose weight. And that's supposed to be helpful. And so when you go in for a sore throat, and the doctor says, lose weight, it's like, OK, but can I get some fucking penicillin? And it's really frustrating. And we have this conversation time and time again, and nobody listens. And, and it's really frustrating when you see it in younger doctors, too, who should know better and should be more open-minded. Um, so we have just a lot of work to do. And, and just to see that knowledge kind of passed down like that, and that's the why. 
the reason why nothing changes. Um, another thing you talk about in the essay that really spoke to me uh, was about your relationship with food um, and how food has been there for you and almost uh, has, has, taken, has supported you, has been there when you're anxious, um, and, and has almost been like a friend. Um, and and I, I want to read again a tweet. Uh, what on earth do people who don't eat their feelings do to survive being a human being? Now, I know that was a rhetorical question, obviously, um, but how has your relationship with food changed since the surgery? Oh, it's so depressing. <laughs> I mean, I'm, it's so depressing. I miss food so much. I can't even, like, it's, I almost miss it as much as I miss smoking, which I miss a lot. When did you quit smoking? I quit smoking at 33. Nice so job. So 10 years ago. All right. Yeah. Hey, clap that up. I love smoking. I smoked for 18 years because I went to boarding school. <laughs> and I learned a lot of really good stuff there. Um, I did. Oh, yeah. And then, like, f we would spray the dorm room and then wave towels and put towels under the door to keep the hall monitor from smelling um, cigarettes or other smokable products. I, I, Not I, that I know anything about that. <laughs> I'm a good at night, girl. Putting it in a soda can so nobody sees the oh, glow. Oh, yeah, with a little piece of tin foil. Like, <laughs> huh? <laughs> it was a good time, but. Um, you know, it used to be that food was comforting, and if I was angry or hurt or upset or happy or bored or lonely, I could just eat and sort of make those feelings go away. And I don't have that coping mechanism available to me, so now I have to feel feelings all the time. It's a nightmare. It's truly a nightmare. And, um, you know, I, I definitely eat whatever I want, but you don't get to eat that much, like five or six bites, and you're like, oh man, I'm done. Oh. And it's so, and like, even when you try to force it and go further, your body is like, mm-mm-mm. It's, the surgery is very effective, I will say. And that's depressing in a way. Like, it really works. Who knew? Yeah, I was, I didn't, honestly, I didn't think it would work. I was just like, well, I've tried everything else. Let me give this bullshit a go. Um, turns out they know what they're doing. Do, are you, do you find yourself turning to something else? Do you got some other habits? Oh, yeah. Alcohol. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought story. you were going to say Pokemon Go. <laughs> no. I'm an adult. True story. Um, <laughs> there is a, a phenomenon of people... Um, getting alcohol, becoming alcoholics after bariatric surgery because you want something else to fill that space. That's not my issue, it's fine. Um, no, I've been doing a lot of reading. I've been doing a lot of television watching, which I did before, but now I'm doing it like in the place of eating. So it's, yeah, you know, it's, uh, and therapy which is why I'm seeing my therapist now, because I, I just was like, I need to stop feeling these feelings. And he was like, mm, that's not what we do here. <laughs> so he's actually helping me develop actual coping mechanisms for feeling feelings and being okay with being unhappy and being okay with being uncomfortable. Ugh. And all that good shit. I mean, Ugh. personal growth is trash. <laughs> Personal growth is trash. Um, well, listen, you've been a very vocal supporter of the Me Too movement, and I just wanted to see, like, how do you feel with where it's at now, where it's going? Has it gone far enough? Oh, it has not gotten far enough. We've barely started. And... <laughs> That's why a lot of the conversations around Me Too are really frustrating, because people want it to be over. They want it to be handled, they want everything to be okay, when we still can't even have honest conversations about how pervasive the problem of sexual harassment and violence are. So um, we are in a good place in that we're having conversations. And I am encouraged to see that um, 
Harvey Weinstein was indicted, which is good. I am discouraged that he was able to let the police know when he was gonna turn himself in and he showed up with a check for his bail. Like, that's oh, rich people shit. Um, and so, you know, you, you win some, you lose some. I'm encouraged by the Time's Up organization and the legal fund that they've set up and how it's dedicated to helping women who need help uh, in terms of money and legal support. And so I just hope that we see people continuing to contribute to that fund and taking advantage of that fund should they need it. And I hope that we stop talking about fatigue and backlash. I think people keep waiting for this backlash as if they want to manifest it and make it happen so that they can say, see, nothing's ever gonna change. I think that's very lazy and the easy way out. So I hope that we keep holding men in general to the fire and burning them until there is nothing left. <laughs> Obviously, a lot of room for growth there, absolutely. Uh, uh, is there one area, or what, what, like, what would you like to see kind of a next step look like in this movement? Hmm. I would like to see less interest in finding out which famous men or women are sexual predators and do more outing of sexual predators at the local Starbucks and the Marriott down the street and the, the insurance company where your friend works. I, I think it's important for anyone to be held accountable for this kind of malfeasance, but as long as we're still interested in sort of the prurient details of famous people, we're forgetting that this happens every single day to people who do not have the same access to justice and recourse. Um, so I would like us to just really focus on everyday people and their struggles as much as we are focusing on famous people and their struggles um, without discounting either. And I also want to see the justice system respond appropriately. I, I do think we need to think about the carceral system and that mass incarceration is a significant problem, but I also think saying, let's just mediate all of this is not the solution either. I'm fine with my rapists going to jail for a long time. Um, that's how I'll find resolution, thank you. So uh, I think we need to have conversations about what justice looks like and what resolution looks like and recognize that it might look like multiple things because I think every person who has suffered violence has a different wish for what their violator would encounter in terms of justice. And so I think we need a more flexible justice system because some people are like, yes, let's sit and and mediate and reconcile this. Um, and some people are like, put them under the jail. And surely we can find some balance and work it out that way. So we'll see. All right. Um, you, you recently edited a book that's out, uh, Not That Bad, about rape culture. You can clap it up for Not That Bad. It's a really incredible collection. You edited it. Um, look, I know you were working on this book long before this moment happened. What did it feel like to have uh, this collection come out and be so timely? It was really surreal. I sold Not That Bad in 2014 or early 2015, well before any of this happened, because I was really interested in the ways in which women diminish their stories of sexual harassment and violence. And it has been a sad coincidence and a sad bit of luck in many ways that people are actually now interested in people's stories of suffering. I wish that wasn't the case, but I am also glad that people are reading this book and reading the amazing contributors um, 
across the gender spectrum who have things to say about rape culture and what it means to live in this world where the phrase rape culture exists. Were there certain stories that you really wanted to make sure were in there um, or, or certain stories that surprised you when they came across your desk? In many ways, every story surprised me. I, I opened up submissions to the public and we got 330 submissions. And a good half of those submissions were just heart-rending testimony. They weren't essays, and it broke my heart to reject them, but I was looking for well-composed writing, and these were just people who needed to share this terrible thing happened to me. And I was surprised, even though I shouldn't have been, by just how much pain there is in this world, and the many ways people have suffered um, from sexual violence. And I shouldn't have been surprised, but I really was. Because you think it's bad, but then you see how bad it is, and it's overwhelming. But the s essays I ended up selecting, each of them surprised me with the insights that they made, and the level of craft on a, a sentence level, and the amount of heart and openness that the writers use to approach this subject. Uh, there's an essay by Anthony Frame that I thought was really, really powerful, and I was really glad to be able to include it. Brandon Taylor wrote an incredible essay. Um, Aubrey Hirsch w wrote the first essay in the collection called Fragments, and I thought it was the really the best essay to open up the conversation that the book engages in because she writes about all of the sort of quotidian ways in which women can deal with harassment in their day-to-day -day lives. And it, it's just these really insidious experiences that everyone knows, and you can see the way in which they start to take their toll. And you can see how a woman could say, I've been through all this, it's not that bad, and how horrifying it is that that's not that bad. So uh, it was just eye-opening for me as an editor, as a person, um, but I, as a collection, I thought the 29 essays came together really well. For somebody who has suffered rape or, or suffered sexual assault and maybe does want to tell their story, as you yourself have done, um, but they maybe are in that stage where they're just writing a testimony, do you have any advice for how to kind of further that process? Oh, yeah. Um, I think that you have to think about what someone else is going to get from the essay other than knowing what happened to you. Uh, it's something I tell my nonfiction students all the time. How do you look both inward and outward? How do you engage in the, in the world around you with your own story? And how do you contextualize your own story in the world that we live in? And I think that's the first thing and the most important thing you need to do once you've gotten the testimony out. How do you shape it into something that is not just for you, but is for someone else to, to read and appreciate and honor? And I think a lot of times people forget that. And I actually understand why, because for so many people, silence is all you've known. And so you just break the silence and it's such a cathartic thing to break the silence that you wanna share it. Um, so just be patient with yourself and give it time to develop into more than just catharsis. Yeah, and, and keep working on it. Um, something that's been happening more and more, and I feel like we're seeing more debates about it in mainstream media even, uh, is incels. Um, radicalized cis men who are taking to violence um, and, but also at the same time, like we're seeing op-eds in the New York Times kind of almost debating these, these, this, this radicalization. Um, does that scare you? Yeah, it does, because it's absurd. Um, I think that... And, and just, sorry, just for the record, if you somehow haven't heard what an incel is, it's a man that basically believes he is owed sex. Yeah, incelibate. Isn't it incelibate? Yeah. <laughs> Involuntary celibacy. Poor baby. Um, you know, I do believe that affection is important and love is important. And I believe that everyone should have their chance to experience 
love, affection, and sex. I do not believe that simply because we exist on this earth, we are owed sex. And unfortunately, that's what incels believe. And they don't seem to realize that the reason that they can't get laid is because they're horrible people. <laughs> it's not about looks, it's not about money, and they have projected their inadequacies into this idea that it's, if they were handsome, if they were rich, they would get women, but they're actually misogynists, and women can smell that on you, and they're like, mm, no thanks. <laughs> and, and it's really dangerous that the mainstream media is giving these people time and attention, because when the New York Times engages their op-ed page in sort of deciding, is this real? and maybe we should legalize prostitution so that these men can be satisfied, as if sex workers don't get to choose who they have sex with. It's offensive, and it's just working from a horrible place of enabling bullshit. So, mm-mm, no thanks. <laughs> um. When I, I, I learned that I was going to be sitting down with you, I got really excited. Uh, <laughs> Me too. Yes. Uh, Roxanne and I have known each other for a really long time. Yes, we have. Yes, we have. And uh, it started over the internet, as so many beautiful relationships do. Amen. Mm. I just wanted to sit in that nostalgia for a second. Uh, but listen, your essay, What We Hunger For, I was really surprised. I'm super surprised to learn this. I looked it up. I was going to be like, ah, 10 years ago. It was six years. Mm -hmm. That was nothing. I know. I mean, six years is a long time, but it's also not the longest time. Eye. What have the last six years been like for you? Mm. They've been great. They've been horrible. <laughs> They've been great. They've been horrible. It's been really interesting. Six, seven, eight years ago, I was writing for free, and uh, I was writing, I was very proud of the work I was doing, but I was really just entering the nonfiction realm and learning how to write an essay and share my opinions. And it snowballed slowly, but steadily. And in some ways, it does feel like just yesterday when I was working with you at the Rumpus and Julie Gracious, and in many ways it feels like a long time ago because things have changed so drastically for me professionally. Uh, but it's been a dream come true. I, I, I can't think of a less cheesy way to say it, but it's true. Um, when you write, you just want someone to read it and hope that they don't hate it. And when people like your work consistently for years, it's really gratifying and it just really affirms everything you've ever believed about yourself. Um, so it's been interesting and awesome and it's also been challenging because people change when you achieve a certain level of success and it has been surprising to see the way in which people I would not have thought would change, change. Um, but my core friends are awesome, and they're the same friends I had six years ago. I'm very consistent in that regard. So there have been ups and downs. Can you talk just a little bit for folks that are unfamiliar with that essay, what it was about, and what it meant for you to share it with the world? What We Hunger For is an essay I wrote about the best book series in the world, The Hunger Games. <laughs> and and when I talk about how much I love it, my students are always like, really? And I'm like, oh yeah, this is happening. I even assign it and make them read it. <laughs> like, this is absolutely happening. We are gonna get all up in this Katniss, Peta, Gale triangle. We are going to talk about how Peta can throw flour and bake bread and um, decorate cakes and uh, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, so it's an essay that looks at why I love The Hunger Games uh, because I felt like that it was a really great articulation of trauma and how one can stay strong and still also be broken. And I also wrote about my own sexual assault at 12 years old and 
what that experience was like. And it ended up being part of uh, my essay collection, Bad Feminist, and the impetus for some of what I talk about in Hunger. Yeah. Did it, did, was it hard to share that? Because I feel like now everyone looks to you and they just see somebody that shares and lives so openly and is so yourself. But has that always been how, how you worked? Well, I actually am a very private person and it's difficult to share personal things, but I try to have a code of ethics for myself and a, a, co a set of boundaries. And I don't transgress those boundaries. And so it is perhaps an illusion of safety that I create for myself, but I need it. And so it's hard, but it's doable. I also tell myself that no one's gonna read my work, uh, which used to work because no one read my work. <laughs> and increasingly it's more difficult to belabor under that delusion, but I, I still maintain it very well. Uh, I always just say, girl, it doesn't matter what you put in that essay, no one's gonna read it, it's fine. And so I just put it out into the world because no one's gonna read it. It's fine. <laughs> nothing, nothing a little self-delusion can't fix. Oh, it, I am a big fan of self-delusion. Love a touch of self-delusion, you like, know? That's mm. my prescription. Like, whatever you've got going on, just lie to yourself. <laughs> uh, well, uh, not trying to burst your bubble here, uh, but you have, you've achieved this incredible incredible level of success. And I, I remember when Bad Feminist came out, and I remember everyone being like, Roxanne Gay, overnight success, like you hadn't been busting your ass for- For 20 years. Decades, <laughs> for mean... decades. Um, and, but you have, you've achieved this level of success. And so I just wanna kinda ask you what it feels like to kind of be a part of these institutions. To, you know, we're here at PEN America, right? We're talking, we're talking here on stage. Um, Everybody's so excited to hear you talk. Everybody's so excited to see you here. Um, but there's also these little things that happen throughout the day, microaggressions, however you want to talk about them. I know when we were tweeting this event, right, to, to you know what I'm going to bring up. I do I know saw, I, I'm going to bring it up. Uh, they they the used the phrase clap back queens. Mm -hmm. What is it like to be at places like the New York Times, to be literally at the center, to have this literary success and still deal with racism and biasness and being dismissed and like just an internet writer and all that stuff. It's really hard. <laughs> it's really hard. Um, and again, don't cry for me. I'll be fine. But it is frustrating to work really hard to take care and have a lot of craft behind your work and then to have people sum up your work as prolific on Twitter. Um, yeah, sure. Prolific on Twitter with a PhD and six books and hundreds of essays and articles. Clap that. <laughs> Dr. Roxanne Gay. <laughs> Don't forget. And then I feel guilty for thinking that because like girl, nobody cares about your degrees. I don't really care unless you're an asshole and then I care. <laughs> um, and, and then I get mad at myself for feeling guilty for daring to believe in myself enough to know that I'm more than a clapback queen on Twitter. Um, like that's not the draw. I mean, if that's the draw, you can just read me on Twitter. It'll be fine, that's not gonna go anywhere. So it can be really frustrating. And I think women in particular get diminished in these ways. Uh, if we write about the personal, we're called diarists, which I still haven't let go of. And that's me, I'm petty. Um, and we're, you know, memoir memoirists and so on. And people ignore everything else that you do for the sort of easiest and most um, popular soundbite and it's just frustrating is the best word for it because it, the world isn't coming to an end but it's frustrating and you just don't see that like no one's ever gonna call Marlon James the Facebook clapback queen but and he is I mean <laughs> so talented. If you don't follow Marlon James on Facebook you're missing out he's he is my, sassy he's actually my second favorite person to follow on Facebook um, the other one being Kiese Lehman, because they're just really interesting and engaging. But men get to be scholars and fancy, and women get to be sort of cute 
and sassy, especially black women. And then, okay, here's their scholarship as a secondary or tertiary accomplishment. Do you have any advice for organizations, institutions, publishers, um, places like the Times uh, that I really feel like are trying to be progressive? Sometimes, you know, and, 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 and wanting to, to move things in the right direction uh, in ways that they can improve and better themselves. I don't think they're trying to be progressive. I think you're giving them way too much credit. The reality is the things that organizations need to do to be more inclusive and more interesting are quite simple. They need to use their money and hire people of color, hire black women, hire queer writers. Uh, take chances on marginalized writers and stop asking them how many Twitter followers they have because if you build it, they will come. And so, you know, we can keep saying they're trying, but they're not trying. They're pretending to try because they don't want to invest actual money in addressing the issues that need to be addressed. And so I think we need to start from a place of honesty where we say these organizations are only interested in the bottom line and they don't recognize that inclusion and diversity can actually contribute to improving their bottom line. Um, and so, yeah, they just need to do better and they know what to do and they need to stop convening panels and having forums and blah, blah, blah. Y'all know what the fuck to do, do it. On a lighter note. Let's go. You mentioned the Hunger Games. Mm. You introduced me to the Hunger Games. I just want to be, first off, I feel very lucky. I learned so much from Roxanne in the time that I've been uh, privileged enough to be friends with her. Uh, I literally am a hick from like North Central Massachusetts and there was a lot of learning that had to happen. But one of the things you taught me how to do was appreciate pop culture. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Yeah, I appreciate that. Channing Tatum, mm. Ina, you know, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, take a moment, think about it. I love him, I just do, I, every time I even think about him, I smile. Um, it was a genuine just, smile. He's a delightful human being with a delightful thick neck. He gives, a, mm. it is, I, I wanna just chew on his neck and smell him and he gives great hugs. He's. Phenomenal. You've He's, hugged Jenny Tatum because you got to interview. You got I that have, hug? I've hugged him a, a few times. Thank you very much. We're buddies. Uh, <laughs> but you you did say earlier the world is ending. I just need to ask, I gotta get an update. What brings you joy these days? What are you watching? What are you into? Oh, Hook yeah. us with some Rex. <sighs> Books bring me joy. They always do. Um, I just finished Children of Blood and Bone by um, Tomi Adeyomi. Okay, whew. I, names are important, so I, I never want to butcher someone's name. And there were parts of it that drove me crazy, but on the whole, I loved it. It was really beautifully done. It's actually reminded me of The Hunger Games, but different, <laughs> very different, and a lot darker oddly enough, which is saying something because The Hunger Games is dark. Uh, children murdering each other for sport. Hmm. Um, what am I watching? I've been watching a lot of Chef's Table because I can't eat. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of guys' grocery games. I'll tell you what, that Guy Fieri is uh, inhuman. <laughs> Just, I really have, I've come to believe that he's an alien from the planet Bleach. And I also watch Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives every Saturday and Sunday night. It's so relaxing. And you just see all this like amazing food that at 43 would give me heartburn for a week. And I'm like, yeah, mm-hmm. But on Guy's Grocery Games, you get to do little activities and cook in a kitchen, in a grocery store. It's great. It's stupid. It's just so stupid. And I admire that. I admire that sort of commitment to banality. And 
the judges always look like the food is actually disgusting and that they're trying to find a way to lie through it while eating it on television. So great. And Chopped, Martha Stewart, is now a judge. I don't know how many of us watched the most recent episode where they had all the rich food um, with gold leaf and caviar and weird stuff that looked disgusting. It was awesome. It was just awesome. And then Martha with her like sort of monotone, this is not good. <laughs> so I've been watching a lot of Food Network. I like it. I do want to say, Guy Fieri, he also does a lot of nonprofit work. Yeah, he's, he's a surprisingly he good He actually dude. seems like a really nice guy. Yeah, I, I would just, hang out with Guy Fieri. His, his food aesthetic is... I mean, about the same as his clothing aesthetic. Yes. 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 Interesting. Very interesting. Interesting. Like, and the thing is, let me be clear. I'm not, like, above eating at his restaurant. I absolutely would um, and enjoy it. It's just... Hmm. I just need to say, I, I'm going to just put it out in the universe, try to will it a little bit. You and Guy Fieri in conversation... Pen America, oh. make it happen. It would be I'm the just saying, Come on, that, that would, would actually be a really good conversation. I'm just saying. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> I do. Like, guy, what's going on with the tips? I like it. Just let's start here. And Some, then. Sometimes you gotta let the people know you're from California. And you know, you're what, a summer boy. He does. <laughs> and one thing I I like about him is that he always involves his kids on his little projects, and I think that's sweet. Uh, I do, I, I, I wanted to ask uh, about, you wrote about Roseanne recently, while mm. we're talking about pop, cu sure. pop, pop culture. Um, you, you basically wrote that you no longer want to consume problematic pop culture. And that's a shift from kind of some of the stuff you were saying in Bad Feminist. What's changed? I think that I have matured and it's more than that. I believe everything I wrote in Bad Feminist. I believe that sometimes, despite our better selves, we consume pop culture that we know is troubling and damaging. The older I get, the more I recognize that it's well and good to do so, but they're going to keep making problematic pop culture if we keep consuming it. It's supply and demand. And so if we cut off the supply, they're going to have to create something new. I mean, if we cut off the demand, rather, they're going to have to change the supply. Um, and now there are some problematic pop culture, you know, do what you want. But there are things like R. Kelly. I'm not going to listen to his music, even though it's catchy, because he's a rapist. <laughs> and it shouldn't be this amazing insight to say, I'm not interested in consuming the art of a rapist, particularly one who predates on young black girls, who are the most vulnerable among us. And I'm not going to watch Woody Allen's movies, no matter how clever he thinks he is. And I'm not gonna watch Roseanne's TV show because she's racist, and she's always been racist. Well, I don't know about always, but in the past eight or nine years, something happened and she let her racist flag fly, which is her right. But it's my right to say that I'm not going to contribute to the millions of dollars that you make every year. Um, because there are so many creators who are not racist. It's a low bar. <laughs> Just don't be racist. Yeah, basically. <laughs> I want to ask, you've got a, uh, a writing project that you're working on right now. I do? I, I think. Yes. A YA novel. Yes. Because you were like, what's the one book I haven't written? Yeah. And you, you go for it, and it's uh, The Year I Learned Everything. Yes. Can you tell us anything about it? It's a nice idea. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I am working on a YA novel called The Year I Learned Everything. It's coming out, well, it was going to come out this year, but... <laughs> it's going to come out next year. Uh, it, next year. And it's about a young woman um, who's dealing with some difficult things at home. She's biracial. She's living in a small town in rural Illinois. 
and she falls in love with a college boy who is unconventionally attractive and he teaches her that she deserves love and affection and that she doesn't have to compromise herself or use her body to earn that love and affection. And so it's about this year of transformation as she comes to realize that she's allowed to say no and she's allowed to be loved. And it's a project that's very near and dear to my heart. It's not something I thought of as YA. It's based on a short story I wrote a few years ago. It's just about a teenager, but I guess they call that YA, which is totally fine. And I'm excited to finish it and get it out into the world and share it with people. Um, you, yeah, go ahead, clap. Uh, speaking of sharing, I feel like I have been hogging all the genius up here. Guys, I know you probably have a lot of wonderful, insightful questions. So there are two microphones up here at the front. I want to encourage people to come up. I am going to again reiterate, please, 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 short, concise questions. I used to be a bouncer. The second one of you says more of a comment than a question, there's going to be blood. But don't be intimidated, I'm really nice. <laughs> I'll start. Uh, thank you very much for your books, I love them. I'm allowed that comment, right, I hope. Um, I would love to hear you talk about your process of editing your own work, um, specifically hunger and how you, if you put it out there and then have people read it as you're writing portions of it, or do you write the whole thing and then have people read it and then how do you taken that feedback, and then as an editor for Not That Bad, how do you shape someone's work? Like, what comments do you think they need to hear in order to make it better? Um, I don't have a standard editorial process. It really depends. Uh, with Hunger, there are a few pieces that were out in the world before the book came out, but I wrote the majority of it between um, September 2016 and February 2017. And I just wrote and wrote and wrote. And then I went back and I decided if it does not relate to my body, then it doesn't belong in the book. And so I had this narrative focus and I used that to help me to shape the book into what it eventually became. And my editorial process when I'm looking at the work of others is actually much the same. I try and decide what I think the focus or the heart of the essay or short story is, and I make editorial comments that will help push the writer more toward the heart and toward the center of the piece. Some pieces come to me and they're actually fairly close to what they need to be, and it might just be a light line edit. And other pieces need more developmental and structural work, and I will put in that time because I want to help the writer make their work into the best that it can be. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi. So there's a moment in Hunger where you talk about walking into a room and sizing up how large you are in comparison to other people. And for me, that was a moment where, like, fat person to fat person, it was kind of like, that's a fucked up thing to do. We shouldn't do that to each other. But I realize hunger isn't just a conversation between fat people taking up space. And so I guess what I'm wondering is how do we have conversations about our bodies, particularly when they're unconventional, when it feels like everyone, particularly thin people or straight-sized people, are listening in or watching? I think that we do it anyway, I, because they are listening and watching, but... <clears throat> If we let that anxiety that they're listening and watching silence us, then we're not getting the help and the support that we need from one another. What I try to do, especially when people ask me questions, fat people ask me questions on Twitter and a skinny person interjects their nonsense, I just say, <laughs> this is not for you. Yeah. Um, and it's weird. The other day I was at an event and a woman came up to me and told me about how she's a size six and people tell her to lose weight. And I was just like, I'm not the audience for this comment. <laughs> because I'm not, like, don't cry to me. I, I genuinely believe everyone has issues that they deal with in their bodies, and I have empathy for that. But I'm personally concerned with fat people and what we deal with and what we face and the ways in which we struggle. 
And so I think it's important to just set those boundaries, know people are listening, but not let them silence because they're already making their thoughts and opinions about us regardless. So if they see how we're speaking to one another, it's either going to reinforce or contradict what they already know, but it's not going to put thoughts into their head that aren't already there. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I just want to start by saying thank you so much for your writing. Um, I very much appreciate seeing someone that I can feel represents who I am as a queer black woman who's also fat. Um, I'm wondering, do you have any thoughts or fears of what you're going to feel like when you eventually have a smaller body? I do. I am terrified because I have been fat for so long, I don't know who I would be if I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And so that's really terrifying. But I, I'm fairly certain I'm always going to be fat. I'm just going to be less fat. And you know, for me, I had some basic goals to be able to go to a theater mm -hmm. and watch a show, to be able to walk for a, a mile or two. Um, so it was more about just lifestyle comfort things mm -hmm. to be able to go into a store like Lane Bryant and buy something. Um, so I don't know, and I'm trying not to think about it because that's not the goal so much. But I'm, I am a, I'm worried about it and I am afraid about it and I'm just gonna have to deal with it when I get there. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I want to welcome you to New York with uh, two questions. The first one is, um, as you mentioned, a lot of women are not able to express their burden and suffering. And a lot of people ask if you or someone else need some help. And I want to, you to tell me if I am right that yes, people do this all the time because Essentially, they are trying to become Messiah. Essentially, they are trying to get the word thank you from these people, and this makes it impossible for a lot of people who really need the help to ask for help and get the help. Another thing is I want you to tell me about your thoughts of the direction of feminism, of feminist movement, that this whole thing is on the track that this whole thing is on. Personally, I am a firm supporter of gender equality and I do sincerely respect the women who are paying their efforts into fighting for this equality. However, what is currently concerning me is that some certain politicians and journalists who's whose purposes could not be told are actually manipulating this whole thing. They are leading the people who believe in this equality to hide, to fury, so that they could achieve their favor. They could do whatever they want. They could favor their own campaigns. I am asking this two I think, things I think, I think we got the question. I think we got the question. Yeah. So, Not sure. what's the question? <laughs> could you think you could do it in like five words? Right there, the first word is Messiah. Okay, I think we. I, I don't think. I don't think we quite got it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I think that. If I understood the general gist, you believe in equality, but you think that journalists are manipulating a feminist agenda somehow? And the politicians, yes. And, okay. Um, I, I, I just don't have a response. That I, I think it, that all kinds of social movements have been manipulated by various constituents over time, but what matters is the movement itself and not what people do in the name of the movement. 
And so it's a distraction to worry about what the media is doing when what we really need to continue to focus on is equality and the role of women and that women are receiving equal opportunities and are able to have unfettered access to birth control and are able to have autonomy over their bodies. And that's what I tend to focus on. Hi. So when you release your nonfiction essays and you're like telling us like your secrets and your experiences and all these very personal things, do you like, do you wait and think to yourself, do I really want to throw this out there before you publish it or do you just do it like right away and don't think? And then do you also, do you ever like look back and you're like, oh, I wish that essay wasn't in Bad Feminist or like, oh, I wish I didn't tell people that? No, I never do. I have no regrets about anything I've ever published. <laughs> Um, in general, there's, I have plenty of time to figure out what I'm going to say and how it's going to make its way into the world. And I do pretend no one's going to read it, but I have boundaries. There are lots of things I don't write about and won't write about. And so uh, if I've put something out into the world, it's because I'm prepared for it to be out in the world. Thank you. about something that has, I've been thinking about and troubled by in the wake um, of the women's marches last year, um, and also after having read The Power by Naomi Alderman. I don't know if you've read that. Um, but I'm thinking, I guess I'm wondering about your opinion about the way in which retaining certain gender labels is useful politically right now, talking about women's rights and women's reproductive rights, um, and also in talking about the Me Too movement and the way that men need to be held accountable but those same labels um, can be very um, exclusionary and end up reinforcing essentialisms and gender binaries that I think you and I both agree we don't ascribe to and sort of how as radical activists we balance those two competing needs. That's a great question. And I don't think we know the answers yet, but I do think that it's not exclusionary to focus on women's rights when women in general are still paid 77% of what men are paid. Like, we haven't even achieved basic equality to be like, okay, now we can abandon this category. Um, I think we need to fight for women's rights and for the rights of people who are somewhere else on the gender spectrum. And so it's women's and and we need to keep saying that and, and not just implying it. But I don't think we need to do away with the category of women. That's not the problem. The problem is that we sometimes close the door after women without thinking about trans people and people who are gender queer who also need to be included and who are as marginalized and as vulnerable as women. I find that the labels still offer something useful. Thank you. Hello, and um, my question is, I was wondering regarding pop culture, if you had um, a personal metric for the difference between when something is simply problematic and when it's catastrophic. Um, and when it's catastrophic? If that makes sense. Uh, yeah. When I'm, yeah. Uh, Absolutely. Um, you know, sometimes we learn that creators are just assholes. <laughs> and lots of people are assholes. Now, I firmly believe that there are enough non-asshole people who can be out there making television shows and so on. But if you want to watch a television show made by an asshole who hasn't committed a crime or who hasn't materially harmed someone, feel free. That's, you know, do what you want to do. Uh, there is a difference. And I actually think it's really, really important to delineate the difference between bad behavior and criminal, and criminal behavior. Uh, but I also think that we tend to diminish certain kinds of bad behavior as not damaging. Like, oh, he just yelled at her. But that's not acceptable. Like, you can't treat people this way. So it's a spectrum of bad behavior. Um, 
and we should delineate the difference, but I also think that it's okay to have a conversation about not being an asshole. And we can have that conversation without implying that we should all hold hands and be like super sweet and saccharine to each other. That's not actually the alternative. The alternative is don't yell at people and berate them and make them feel small and make them want to quit an entire industry because of how you treated them. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Roxanne. Um, I'm a huge fan of your work and I'm really excited to be here. Um, I wanted to ask you, so Hunger and Bad Feminist are some of the most influential books I've ever read. Um, and I wanted to get your personal opinion on what are some other writers and works that you think, you know, for someone who's motivated or inspired by some of your work, um, who else should we be exposing ourselves to? Um, I think you should read Eloquent Rage by Brittany Cooper, mm -hmm. which is an incredible book. Mm -hmm. And it's a book focused explicitly on black women and black women's feminism. It's awesome. I recently read it and was incredibly moved by it. I think that um, Lower Ed by Tressie McMillan Cottom is a brilliant book about, uh, uh, about for-profit education, but it focuses on how the people who are most damaged by for-profit education are women and black women in particular. And all of her work is incredible. She is truly leftist and is doing some really interesting leftist thinking. And uh, so I recommend those two women these days. Cool, thank you. Thank you. And I'm so sorry to be the party pooper, but we've got two more questions, all right, gang? I'm so sorry. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I have a question that's sort of similar about pop culture from the guy in front of me, but I decided to still ask it. And it's sort of regarding Childish Gambino and This Is America and um, Donald Glover in general because I don't really have a stake in it, but I've been trying to figure out whether his, because he, I don't know if you know this, but he has a lot of allegations about sexual assault and harassment around him and this idea of, you know, consuming media that is untainted by sexual assault. I'm just, I don't know, that was a, sorry, that wasn't a full question, but I'm wondering your thoughts on him and and how we grapple with the fact that he has done bad things and the fact, and does that let him make media that affects the world in a positive way? And I guess I'm wondering, how did you consume that? Um, I've never heard anything about Donald Glover and oh, sexual okay. assault. Um, that's not true. Oh, good. <laughs> um, Donald Glover, I think, has done some problematic things, but it, as far as I know, right. has nothing to do with sexual assault. And I think the first thing is to make sure that you're clear on the kinds of things that you're putting out into the world, especially about black men, mm -hmm. where crime is concerned. Um, so I had no problem consuming it. I, I mean, I've definitely heard things about uh, how he views black women right. and um, things like that, but it's not about assault. Again, it's about asshole versus mm -hmm. criminal. Uh, I thought This Is America was interesting and thought-provoking. I do not think it was the revolution that many people said it was. Um, and that's not shade, that's just an opinion. Uh, I think he's incredibly talented. I don't know what the man can't do. Uh, and I admire that very much. And I thought the imagery in particular in This Is America was really great and really startling. And it made me think. And the ways in which people immediately started to make gifts and repackage it on social media spoke beautifully to the point he was trying to make. And so when you can create art that provokes people into exactly what you want to provoke people into, that's admirable. You do that too. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Roxanne. Hi, Amani. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you. Um, this time on the East Coast. Yes. Which is the best coast. Um, if you say so. <laughs> we hadn't fought the whole time. And you got to just come start some. Uh, that's, yeah. We were on uh, a John Lovett podcast together. Ooh, uh, yes. Pod Save, not Pod Save America, the other one. Whatever. A white Love boy Love it show. or leave it. Yes, thank mm -hmm. you. Um, this is a question I never had the chance to ask you. So um, for those who don't know, I'm the editor-in-chief of MuslimGirl.com. I was actually supposed to be part of the Penn Festival this year, but our panel got canceled. It was called No Country for Muslim Women. 
And ironically, my co-panelist, who's also a fellow Muslim woman, got barred from entering the country when she was on her way over here for it, so it got canceled. Um, and I bring this question to you because I think, first of all, you have like the expertise to answer it, and I think this week is the perfect week to answer it after Kim Kardashian was very influential in the release of, or in the pardon of Alice, um, who was released from prison after her, you know, visiting President Trump. And, you know, there are mixed reactions, right? There are people that are saying she needed to use her influence for good. Others are saying that her doing so is going to be used and tokenized by Trump for his, for his causes. This also happened the same week that Trump just hosted a Ramadan iftar at the White House. Um, ironically, just a couple of days ago, but he had very few Muslim friends to invite to it. I think there was like one table in attendance. Um, but I pose this question especially as women and women of color, because we are in a moment where we are witnessing this like diversity trend and a lot of doors are opening wide open for us. And we want to take advantage of these opportunities to access these spaces that have historically been denied from us. But how do we know if what we're engaging with is really progressing us forward towards equality and justice? or whether we are being tokenized and getting played the F out? I mean, we don't sometimes, and sometimes we do, and we just have to make the best of it. You know, the Kim Kardashian thing, she's getting all the attention, but there are, there's actually an organization that put in like 20 years of work to get Alice released from prison, and that's where the focus should be. They're the ones who did it, and then Kim Kardashian, um, Kim Kardashian got interested, as rich people tend to do, in this, this thing, and she did something good. And it's going to end up being exploited, but you know, I think the focus here should be on a woman who was really wildly over-sentenced, finally being out of prison and getting to meet her grandchildren and great-grandchildren for the first time. And if that means that Donald Trump gets to get some, make some hay out of Kim Kardashian, I think we can accept that because we're not in prison. It's really easy for us to judge it when we're not incarcerated. It, but it is challenging, and I think it's important to understand the motivations of the people who purport to help us and to speak for us or to speak with us, because oftentimes they're doing it for their own ends. And I think it takes a lot of strength to be able to look at someone and say, I recognize that you want to help me in a surface way, but you're not actually going to help me in a meaningful and long-lasting way. And I think sometimes we have to find a way to say no to the easy opportunity because it's actually only going to help us as individuals and not ev more people. And so it's just a question of judgment and developing that kind of judgment. And it takes time to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Roxanne Gay! If you stick around, Roxanne will be signing momentarily. Signing momentarily. Thank you all so much for joining us.